When I hear that uh, kind of introduction, I can only think of those words from Corinthians. His grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in weakness. Even to this day, after 60 years walking with Jesus, uh, I still have many weaknesses. I especially struggle with a lot of discouragement almost every day. I'm bombarded by doubts, especially when Quite a few Christian leaders have abandoned what I believe about people, that people without Jesus are lost. And uh, it's hard to read those books, attacking those things, making fun, mocking anybody who believes that someone else, these are, these are Christians writing these books. And so often I think, am I wrong? My whole life trying to rescue the perishing. We have a thousand people working in places like uh, Algeria, Morocco, Turkey, Saudi Arabia. You know those places. Why do we have 1,000 people there? What are they doing? If all roads to lead to heaven, all religions are the same, then I have basically wasted my life and I have led hundreds of thousands. Uh, so I'm told by different people to waste their lives. But somehow I hold through all my struggles and weaknesses, tears, yes, lots of sadness, like what we just referred to, that plane crash. And then the other one that came a little later, I watched the funeral on television right here in Malaysia when the bodies came back uh, from the Ukraine. What a horrendous uh, thing. But I have full confidence in Malaysian Airlines and I flew here on Malaysian Airlines and I'm flying to Bangkok on Malaysian Airlines and I've just been to Vietnam on Malaysian Airlines and I'm going back to London on Malaysian Airlines. So, God bless. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And I stand on that challenge also, Acts 12, 1, there is no other name given among men whereby ye can be saved. Maybe in the end, when we stand before God, maybe we, 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 we were wrong. And somehow some others got in there some other way. I'm not going to take a chance on that. I'm going to stand on God's word. I want to thank you for praying for OM. I want to thank you for not only praying, but supporting financially the ministry. You're the only church in Malaysia that supports my little, I stepped out of the leadership of OM completely 12 years ago, but they left me with one of my little favorite things to raise money and give it away for projects, especially Bible, scriptures, evangelistic DVDs, but also emergency needs that the Holy Spirit puts on my heart. They're usually not huge. And I uh, Thank you for supporting the Ministry of Special Projects, what we're trying to do in connection with AIDS. You've shown interest in that. And it's just uh, a great privilege to be involved. I, the reason I was in Vietnam is to get a number of projects going. Very few books in Vietnamese. We hope to launch at least 10 new books and finance them in Vietnam. We have the Jesus DVD. I hope you know about that DVD. You can pick up a sample at the OM display. That is the hottest evangelistic tool in the world today, especially when you can also download it on your telephone in hundreds of languages. And so we're trying to mobilize the whole church to give the DVD to everybody in their nation who speaks one of those languages. I think the DVD you can pick up this morning actually has a number of different languages on it. It's just such an amazing uh, just such an amazing tool. Cantonese, English, Fu Chao, Hakka, Mandarin, Tamil, Tao Chu, Urdu, Nepali, Hindi, Burmese, all on one little DVD. What an amazing tool. Be sure to pick up a sample. We hope to flood out 100,000 of these in Malaysia in the next year. We never do it without the help, of course, partnership of dynamic local churches. We're seeing tens of thousands of these go out in Russia. I've been to Russia each year for the last two years. It's a tough country now. And the response has not been uh, the way some people dream, but still God is moving in Russia. 
And I'm just so thankful for your faithfulness and your prayers. Many times I take this jacket and present it to someone who's made an impact for global missions. And uh, some time ago, I presented one to Daniel. But tonight, God, this morning, God's put it on my heart to present this jacket to Brother Kevin to honor him and the great work he has done for global missions. So please come forward, take that jacket off that you have. Take the jacket off. <laughs> okay, hallelujah. Thank you. As you might imagine, I've been through two or three hundred of those jackets over these uh, 30 some years that I discovered it. Sometimes we auction it. I left one behind on the Dulas, a ship that many of you visited. I think it was in Ireland. And so one wild Irishman gave sing, some big song and dance about the value of this jacket. And he auctioned it and got 90,000 American dollars for the jacket, uh, which went toward the purchase of the new ship. So uh, there are many stories about these uh, global jackets. They don't make the impact they used to when I wear them, but... Um, when I show my global underwear, that makes a bigger impact. <laughs> but I'm not planning to do that. I made an agreement with my wife about that particular um, thing that I only actually did a few times. We're going to quickly watch an audiovisual of OM. I've never in all my meetings here taken much time to share about OM, a movement I'm still part of. I believe that OM in many ways is healthier than ever in our history under the leadership of Lawrence Tong of Singapore. And I'm going to the OM leaders meetings. I don't have much to do there. I just meet and pray with individuals. And we'd appreciate prayers. Over 300 gathered in Bangkok. Pastor Daniel spoke at that same conference some years ago. Um, we are just trusting God to move in our midst. So rather than me share about OM, let's see this brand new audiovisual. Yesterday evening is the first time I've ever seen it. So uh, let's see what the new audiovisual younger generation are producing. Woo! OM is mobilizing for missions. Since 1957, Operation Mobilization has motivated people to pray, give, and go, to make disciples of all nations, and to be His witness to the ends of the earth. Today, 6,100 people work in 110 countries and aboard the OM ship Lagos Hope. Our heartbeat is to make Jesus known through evangelism, relief and development, church planting, justice, and mentoring the next generation. We need people to pray, give, and go in these five areas. Evangelism. Christ commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. OM's passion is for everyone to know Jesus and to understand God's will. Our short-term teams and long-term workers share God's love with those who've yet to hear. Relief and Development Christians respond generously to human need. OM brings help to the suffering and dignity to the poor. People find God when mercy and compassion are shown in His name. OM empowers believers in business to have a lasting kingdom impact in their community. Church planting. OM's goal is to establish healthy Christian communities with indigenous leadership. We equip groups of new believers to become self-sustaining churches that bring the gospel to their nations. OM serves the church by raising mission awareness, promoting global intercession, and encouraging radical discipleship. Justice. As God's people, we need to release the oppressed and speak for those who have no voice. Then we will truly see the gospel transform lives. OM works at all levels of society to increase awareness of injustice and to bring hope to the persecuted. Mentoring. Discipleship in OM is hands-on, training side-by-side -side on the streets and together on international teams. 
Faithful accountability strengthens us and accelerates personal growth. We run courses to invest in our people who go on to impact thousands of others every year. So, look at the world, look at your own life and ask, what can I do? Well, you can pray. People in churches grow as they pray. OM provides the latest worldwide prayer information through our magazine, on our website, and through personal meetings. God calls us to pray for the world. Will you join us? Or you can give. Giving allows you to make a difference and express God's love in a practical way. OM's extensive ministries and faithful workers are worthy of your support. We maintain high standards of accountability and welcome you to partner with the ministry that God places on your heart. You can also go. God can use your hands and your feet in mission, and OM provides opportunities that range from a few weeks to a lifetime. Just come willing to use your skills to bring hope and transformation. OM provides the first experience of global mission for thousands of people. God can use you to impact eternity. God has called us to partner together to do His will. What part are you going to play? Let's pray together. Thank you, yes. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing around the world through OM. But even more, we thank you for what you're doing through the whole body of Christ. Through every agency, through every biblical church denomination, through individuals. And Lord, just commit to you our time looking into your holy word together. That we may grow in grace and a knowledge of you because we've been together here this morning. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you'll visit the OM uh, display and pick up that DVD, some other literature. We really do need your prayers. Counting India, there are now 7,000 of us full time. Some of those have uh, jobs, but most of them are dependent through prayer on the Lord's people to uh, supply their needs. That's the way my wife and I have lived as well since we launched out way back in 1960, just celebrated 55 years of marriage and walking by faith. And what amazing things we've seen. His grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in weakness. And this morning we're here to try to think through the challenge of finding the balance between radical discipleship, which was the whole birth sort of trademark of OM, and radical grace, which took us a, long, a little bit of a longer time to understand, and we made a lot of mistakes in the process. And one of the reasons I'm still taking uh, so many meetings each year, number of reasons, but one of them I feel the urgency, the mandate to pass on so much that the Lord has given to me. Hundreds of men and women of God have influenced me through their tapes, the tapes and books of A.W. Tozer, the friendship I had with uh, Billy Graham and Oswald Smith and Dr. Francis Schaeffer. People like Buck Singh of India became one of my closest friends, uh, laboring together in India. And many women as well have been such a huge impact, like that professional writer Eugenia Price or Debbie Maroff, who worked on my team for many years, another professional writer. So I hope Somehow this morning, I can pass on something of what God has given me. I'm totally still stunned that God has been able to use a character like me. But I believe one of the reasons I'm here is God wants to say to you what I know he's already said to you. He wants to use you. You as an individual are important to him. I think you all know my favorite story, but I can't resist telling it again, just for any who are new. It's the story of the family in the thunderstorm. Remember, the lightning was so bad, the thunder was so loud that even the, even the adults were nervous. And then they realized the little, their little daughter was alone up in her bedroom. And so they ran upstairs and they opened the door and they expected to see her hiding under the bed. But no, she was looking out the window. 
Boom. There was another flash of lightning. They said, are you okay? They were so concerned. Are you okay? And she said, well, I'm fine. I think God is taking my picture. Wow. God's taking your picture. God's taking your picture. I remember the burst of selfies that hit Malaysia more than any country I've been in. I was down in the streets in the center of town where I was staying, and it seemed that everybody was selling these cameras on the end of a stick. I've been taking selfies for 40 years. You don't need a stick. You just need, you know, a long arm. Of course, many of my photos, my face didn't actually appear, but uh, God loves you. God has a great plan for your life. Beware of putting yourself down. Beware even of false spirituality so that you think somehow being humble is putting yourself down. We're kings, we're priests, we're ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not ashamed, as it says in Romans, of the gospel of Jesus. I know many of you have appointments right after this meeting and, and you rush off but I beg of you to visit one of the best Christian book displays of any church I've been in in the entire world. And we've just added a few of our books to your display that are available today at a special price. And we'd like you to stop by and pick them up. We especially would like you to pick up Calvary Road, a Christian classic about the cross, about personal revival. One of the first books that came into my life about grace, that movement that came out of the revival in Africa was a movement of grace. And yet there was the message of the cross. So pick that book up. My own books are also available, uh, Out of the Comfort Zone, which is with its new last chapter called Messiology. My book, No Turning Back. This is one of my favorite books, Spiritual Leadership. It's in probably 50 languages. Uh, just a classic a basic book on leadership, and many of you are in leadership. Even if you're, uh, if you're a father or a mother in a family, that's also leadership. Sometimes a bigger challenge than leading the church. And there's Debbie Maroff's brilliant book, True Grit, the most important book in my life in the last 10 years about women, what they're suffering, and yet what some of them are doing. And I urge you to pick up this brand new revised edition of True Grit. And then there's this book about the Dalits, the untouchables of India, now numbering court more than a quarter of a billion. This is a form of slavery. We need to understand this better. Even many people of Indian background don't understand. And I'd urge you to pick up Joseph D'Souza's book on the Dalits. And then Peter Maiden, who led OM, uh, ten years before Lawrence uh, became the leader, his brilliant book on discipleship and also a brand new book on leadership that I'm trying to flood out in dozens of languages around the world, Leading with Love. Turn with me now in your Bibles quickly to the book of James. We're going to look at a number of scriptures. I have confidence in the Lord that he is going to use his holy word to speak to our hearts and to minister to us in a powerful way this morning. The book of James, chapter 1. How many of you have your Bibles? Hold your Bible up. Let me see your Bibles. Hold your Bibles up. Wow. You know, millions of African believers sitting in church in Africa today, do not have their own Bible. Did you know that? A couple million, I'm told, in their own language. Some of them may have little pieces. I heard of a pastor who was preaching out of some segments he got out of someone else's Bible in English. He had a few segments, and he was using that, converting it in his thinking into the African language when he preached. I hope that is something that doesn't happen much. It just seems so bizarre. But let's be thankful that we have our own Bibles. One of my, and I have about a hundred different projects going now, but one of them is to put Bibles in the hands of poorer believers 
even when sometimes the Bibles are available, they're expensive, and so they're not able to get one. Please pray, as it's quite complicated uh, to do this all over Africa. I have this beautiful new Bible that someone just uh, gave me, this ESV version. I normally use my other Bible, the NIV, so I've got both of them here. The book of James. I think the best place to pick it up there in the first chapter is around verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be kind of first fruits of his creation. Know this, my brothers, let every person be quick to hear. God has so used this in my own life. I was not a good listener. I was not even a good listener to my own wife. And I made mistakes in my marriage because I, I wasn't a good listener. I didn't know how to listen to my own three children. When they trying to talk, as soon as I heard something I felt wasn't correct, I interrupted them. I was an interrupter. And I thank the Lord for people that pointed that out in my life. I remember once my wife was trying to talk to me, and I wasn't really listening because I wasn't actually interested in what she was saying. And... Uh, she stopped and said, are you listening? Of course, my pride locked in. Of course, darling, my wife, of course, I'm listening. You're special, I love you, I'm listening. She said, what did I say? I think I said, honey, I, I don't think that's fair to like, get into the details. It's just general listening. Quick to listen. How are you doing? Husbands, how are you doing, huh? Listening to your wife. Let's read on. Verse 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away. He goes away and forgets what he's like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. C.S. Lewis said this man whose writings in his life brought thousands to Jesus, including atheists and agnostics. He said we have the tendency to think, but not to act. We have the tendency to feel. Like when we think about that airplane that we've just been thinking about, or we think about and see these pictures coming from Syria, coming from northern Nigeria. We have the tendency also to feel we're human. But he went on to say that if we keep feeling without acting, someday we will be unable to act. This is why many of God's chosen people have become many of God's frozen people. No longer involved in the prayer ministry of the church. No longer sharing their faith. Mainly just going to church on Sunday morning and giving a little bit of acknowledgement about their faith. I referred to this when I spoke at that Urbana convention in America way back, I think it was in 1968, I called this and I got in trouble for it, spiritual schizophrenia, where people are living like two different lives. In church, uh, they're singing, they're praising the Lord, they, they have their Bible, but from Monday through Friday, and especially uh, during the weekend, they're often living quite a different life. Some 4,000 stood to their feet at that meeting when I shared my testimony to acknowledge 
that they were playing games, that they weren't radically committed to Jesus. They especially acknowledged, as I had shared my own struggle with lust and lust of the eyes and pornography, many of them acknowledged that that also was the area where they were making a mess. And I believe a mini revival came upon that gathering. And for the last 40 years, I've met different people from that meeting serving Jesus around the world because they stood up and they did business with God. And so our challenge this morning is to be a doer of the word. Many of you already are. I commend you in the name of Jesus. You're involved in missions. You're involved in the prayer ministry of the church. You're involved in sharing your faith. I've had about 50 visits to Malaysia, certainly in the top 10 countries in my life that I'm involved with. And I'm involved with about 125. But I often, when I talk to people, hear them express how hard it is to share their faith with certain uh, people in this community because of complexity and legislation. I urge them not to give up and to, and to be creative. And some of you are doing that. But I also urge people, okay, leave that for a while. If you find that is a Mount Everest, that's just too much for you. Why don't you share with people of your own background? And let's thank God. Let's thank God in Malaysia for the tremendous freedom that we have. All of life is compromised. And I know living in this nation and many nations in the world today involves compromise. But I believe God has given us a unique open door. And who knows what will happen in the future as we're faithful to the freedom and liberty he gives us at a certain level right now. I'd urge you to take some of these DVDs. No, one of the key languages is left out of this DVD. Okay, let's make use of what we have. And God in his timing may open new doors. We never dreamed in Algeria where people were laboring for 100 years with no fruit in a difficult, hard country that in God's timing, starting 15 years ago, and Daniel, you've been there, Berbers started to come. Muslim background, Berbers started to come to Jesus. And now they're 20 or 30,000 worshiping this morning there in Algeria. No one even dreamed of this, including Charles Marsh, who wrote that book, Too Hard for God, and who laid his life down in Algeria with almost no fruit. One of OM's mentors. Be ye doers of the word. Otherwise, you're deceiving yourself. The most subtle form of deception surely is self-deception. Turn with me now to the book of Acts, chapter 20, which became an important part of my life when I was a baby Christian. I was still in the fire extinguisher business. I sold fire alarms and fire extinguishers and had about 200 people working for me part-time as I was a wholesaler. And so I was setting up agencies they could only just learn how to drive, driving across the whole of the United States. And when I got to Pittsburgh, in the home of my aunt who loved Jesus, I met her mother who was really strong on baptism. And she sort of scared me a bit. So I read the whole book of Acts that night. And this verse, Acts 20, 24, that night became my life verse, my life motto, my life passion, and I want you to read it with me. Acts 20 and verse 24, Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders, and maybe we'll just read a few of the verses. They're so important. I lived among you, verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews how I did not shrink declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you publicly and from house to house, someone called that 2020 vision, Acts 2020, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe there's someone this morning that verse is not yet, that basic verse is not yet real to you. You've never really repented and believed on the Lord Jesus. I've just celebrated my 
60th spiritual birthday there in Kathmandu, Nepal with 100 leaders and friends for a party and a dinner. Yes. If you have one birthday, you go to hell. If you have two birthdays, you go to heaven. You may not know the date, but you know in your heart, maybe as a child, your mother informed you that you believed, repented, and believed on the Lord Jesus. Many who, of course, make these childhood decisions later on have a powerful experience with the Holy Spirit or some kind of other recommitment. In my own ministry, at least 150,000 around the world have made some kind of recommitment of their life to follow Jesus and sometimes to serve him. But the verse that really hit me was, if you read on, verse 24, Acts 20, verse 24. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone, sorry, wrong verse, just before that, but I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. Wow. Let me read that again. I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Would you take, I hope you'll take all the verses that I'm, I'm talking about this morning, but would you take that one verse in a special way? Would you be able to pray that, that same prayer of commitment, of vision, of love, of reality? Nothing moves me. I count my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course. The ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus Christ, at my age, now 76 years of age, I know I'm getting near the end of the course. Oh, I may get a few more years. It's in the Lord's hands. But many people certainly uh, in the 70s, <laughs> they're off to glory. Every week I have a friend who goes to glory. I could be almost full time just going to funerals. And they're often tremendous celebrations. And so I have the joy of looking back and saying the commitment I made when I was 17 has been a burning reality in my heart every day. I do not exaggerate. I don't understand how that happened except in all my fear and struggle and weakness. I just went one day at a time. Just, and often when I wake up, I'm, I'm quite frightened especially when I was a leader and I started this ship thing. That really scared me, especially living on the ship. And then the work in India started exploding and we were often not having the money and the banks were wondering what's going on with these bills that we needed to pay and people were criticizing me from every side. I thought, Lord, how can I, how can I carry this load? I'm just a weak, loudmouth New York City kid who somehow got saved in a Billy Graham meeting. Lord, what have I got myself into? But somehow I cast myself, 1 Peter 5, 7, I cast myself upon him. And each day, yes, each day since my conversion, even in the midst of pure stupidity, like when I was arrested by the Soviet police, or I got arrested in Bombay for George Verwer's stupidity, somehow I experienced the grace of Jesus. Radical discipleship, yes, but with it, radical grace, knowing you are forgiven, knowing that he loves you. Yes, he's taking your picture. Maybe you've already embraced this. Then just give thanks for what he has given you. But if somehow in your pilgrimage for the Lord, you've not yet embraced this radical discipleship, radical grace combination. I pray this morning may be your moment, your hour of decision, and that you would take a step of faith. Acts 20, verse 20. My final scripture is in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians and chapter 12. Again, I've already referred to this, but let us read it from the Word of God. 2 Corinthians, verse 12, about grace, about 
his grace being sufficient, his strength being made perfect in weakness. Again and again, when I've failed, when I've had struggles, I've gone to this passage about the thorn in the flesh and how somehow, though Paul prayed that this may be taken away, somehow it was still, it was still there. Look at verse 8 in chapter 12. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should lead me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. I'm not positive of this, but I think one of my thorns in the flesh has been uh, the lust of the eyes. Before I was a Christian, about 32 different girls had blown my romantic circuits. Fortunately, in my day, we didn't jump in bed. We just kissed up a storm and uh, did a lot of dancing. But girls were so attractive, so beautiful. I had so many photographs. And then when I gave my life to Jesus in this Billy Graham meeting, I didn't know what I was getting into. And I met a Christian that said, you know, now as a, a follower of Jesus, you, you can't go around kissing all these girls that you've been doing. I said, what? Billy Graham didn't say anything about that in the message. And I needed a verse, thou shalt not kiss. So I looked. I never found any verse that thou shalt not kiss. I saw the Ten Commandments. I didn't see the Eleventh. And so, of course, I just kept kissing any girl available. I can assure you they were not all available. It got very confusing. I led a girl to Jesus once, and then I kissed her for the next hour. That's, uh, believe me, that's not in the follow-up books. And then another girl, I got in a messy situation in the back of a car in a church parking lot. That's always a safe place in America. And uh, then another situation where I was in another car and the police banged on the window because we're in the woods. He thought we were doing something really wrong. That was a real messy night, messy night in my life. And I just uh, found it very difficult in that first couple of years uh, with this tremendous sort of testosterone pumping through my body to somehow walk in purity. But from this word, memorizing scripture, walking in the light, experiencing the reality of the Holy Spirit, he gave me the grace to leave those things behind. Maybe, you know, kissing girls is not some great evil, but Hebrews 12 says, we're running the race. We're running the race. We, nail it. we need to lay aside anything that's hindering. And my, my world of romance was hindering me. So I went on a two-year fast. I think I've spoken about this before. Two years. That's when I went to Mexico. That's when I learned Spanish. That's when this thing started. No more kissing. No more dating. Just the word of God, prayer. I mean, occasion, kissing my pillow. That's, yeah. Then that's when I left. I left uh, university studies, liberal arts studies, and I went to Chicago, the Moody Bible Institute. Oh, what an experience that was. Bible college. Again, it was a new world for me. Pages of rules, all kinds of rules and regulations in this Bible college. And uh, at the same time, there were beautiful girls. I was infatuated with about seven of these. They're carrying big Bibles. You know, you try to kiss one, you get a King James to the head. <laughs> and so, though I was infatuated with about seven girls. I never, I never kissed any of them. And in God's mercy, I kept taking, you know, Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Marriage, Lord, marriage, one wife, all these things will be added unto you. And in his mercy, it happened only because of my evangelism. Did I ever meet this amazing woman who became my wife? I went to rent an evangelistic film. She was in charge of the films, huh? God's providence. I saw her, my romantic circuits went on overload and blew. I broke my fast, moved in on the target. I said something completely stupid, 
and it really scared her, very quiet girl from Wisconsin. She never met anybody from New York City, much less my kind of extrovert, loud mouth, aggressive, offensive, rude temperament. And so uh, she was not interested. I managed to get her on a date. I was so cuckoo over her, I tried to scare her away. I thought I got that idea from Gideon, scare her away. And so I said to her, look, probably nothing gonna happen between you and me, but just in case, hint, 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 just in case, you need to know I'm gonna be a missionary. And if you marry me, probably you will be eaten alive by cannibals in Papua New Guinea. <laughs> I actually said that. And uh, needless to say, she was not in love with me, but I mobilized my prayer. The greatest answer to prayer in my life is when God broke this woman's heart and she said that she'd marry me. Not only that, she began to believe I was a man of God. She wanted to marry a man of God. And then she began to believe I was a Bible teacher, a man of the word. She wanted to marry a man of the word. I took advantage of that and gave her the key verse. Not the whole chapter, the key verse from Ephesians. Submit to your husband as unto the Lord. Yeah. She accepted it. She agreed to marry me. She gave me all her money. She'd be a millionaire today. She had money because her father was killed in the war from inheritance. We sent all that to Mexico. I got her to start to sell all of her possessions. And uh, I shared my philosophy. We're not going to spend any money. There's no honeymoon. I don't believe in weddings except a quick thing after the Sunday morning service. And we're going to be living in the floor on the back of a, the Christian bookshop. We, I just opened in Mexico City. And everything is for Bibles and for literature and for evangelism. She accepted it. There we were in Mexico, and everything I asked her to do, she did it. We had a wonderful marriage for two weeks. And then she read the other verses. She read the whole chapter. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How are we doing, husbands? We got a lot of all-star Malaysian husbands who are putting that into practice every moment, every hour of every day. Yes, we had a lot of difficulties in our marriage as we discovered how different we were. And my tongue, I'm so ashamed to say it, my tongue hurt my wife many, many times. And yet she stuck with me and affirmed me through many, many a crisis, many, many a difficulty. His grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon you. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships. It shifts, doesn't it, quickly to a whole different kind of testing and trial, persecution, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I know there are different interpretations to this great passage, but I believe the Holy Spirit, as you study his word, will, ex will, will shine forth this message of radical grace. Have you read anything by Philip Yancey, who's become a close friend? His new book, Vanishing Grace. What a, what a spokesperson he has, he has become for the kingdom. Charles Swindoll has ministered to me through his book, Grace Awakening. I've just ordered another 5,000 copies. That chapter, graciously disagreeing and pressing on. And that, that chapter, oiling your marriage through grace. Oh, God used it just as he used this book, Calvary Road, in the early days of my Christian life to break me. God uses broken vessels. The word is clear. Humble yourself. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And then he will exalt you. He will use you in due course. Brothers and sisters, it's not an accident that we're here this morning. One of the toughest things I have to decide is where I speak each Sunday. 
They wanted me in Bangkok because the conference is in Bangkok. They emailed me, hey, we want to book you Sunday morning in Bangkok. I said, no, I'm sorry. I'm booked at the Dream Center, one of my favorite churches in planet Earth. So they're praying for me and I think will meet me happily at the airport. We're not here. We're not here by accident. 100,000 people follow me in prayer. We're here because God wants some of you to do business for him, to take some kind of step of faith. And Pastor Daniel will lead us in an invitation that you're quite accustomed to, to come forward and pray. And I just pray some of you, even though maybe you've taken that step before, you've been to this altar before, I pray that today somehow will be a U-turn. I pray that some of you who are walking in one direction, you will do a U-turn and go in God's direction and that it will include embracing the nations. It will include embracing the suffering people of the world. It will include radical discipleship and radical grace exploding in your life to touch this city, this nation, and to touch the world for Christ. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we believe your Holy Spirit is moving in hearts and lives here this morning. We believe, Father, that you want many of us to take steps of faith, to be your men, to be your women, to embrace radical discipleship, to forgive ourselves of something that we're struggling with, and to forgive others who may have hurt us deeply in the midst of the battle. We pray, God, for nothing less than a revolution of love that will impact our churches and our nation and the nations around us. For we ask in the, the authority and the glorious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you.